Well, we want to welcome you guys to Wednesday night Bible study. I enjoy Wednesday night Bible studies. It gives me a chance to kind of get into the Old Testament a little bit and uh, to familiarize you with the Old Testament and how God's word is applicable, whether we're in the New Testament, Jesus' words, or uh, the apostles' words, or even in the Old Testament when God spoke to the people through his prophets and always trying to uh, help them when they're at their worst, correct them when they needed correction for sure, but always with an intent and a purpose to bring people back to himself. You got to love that about God. When he says he loves you and you belong to him, you really do. I mean, you might mess up, you might be a knucklehead, and he might let you suffer some consequences for that. But in all of that, even the things that we go through, he allows us to go through them so we become a little bit more sensible, so we're not so uh, lost in our stupor, if you may. Uh, we do some dumb things sometimes as human beings, but the Lord loves us, and he's always has his spirit uh, convicting us of a wrong and convicting us that God still cares and he's willing to forgive us. And aren't you glad that you have a heavenly father like that? I know I am. It's, it's a great thing. So tonight we uh, start a brand new book. We're on the 28th book of the Bible and we're skipping through Daniel. Daniel would be our next book, usually uh, following Ezekiel. But because we did a Sunday series on Daniel before we did Revelation, I thought that would uh, go ahead and skip it at this time and go on to the next book, which is Hosea. The 28th book of the Bible, as I said, and uh, yeah, we're going to learn some things about God, a little bit more about God, which is good for us. If you're listening on radio, we want to welcome you. If you're watching from home, you're part of our online church audience, listen, we appreciate you. Glad that you guys are listening as well, and, and keep us in prayer. Calvary Chapel Montrose in prayer. We appreciate your prayers, and, and I hear from you guys from all over the, the place, uh, all over the states. Uh, and it's kind of neat that we could uh, do that, uh, tune into some of our technology and be able to uh, be in your home. So thank you for inviting us in, that we could be there. Again, our Bible passage is Hosea, but our title is, if you can look up here, our title is just an introduction. I want to introduce this book to you. I want to let you know who Hosea was. I want to let you know the purpose that this book has been written. I want you to understand... Uh, how God is always, again, looking to uh, have his family, you and I, the folks of old, you know, to uh, bring them together to him. And so he allows things to happen. So in that, you're going to see or we're going to grow in learning a little bit more about God. Uh, sometimes we say, I know the face of God. I know how he deals with us. I know when he looks at us. But scripture is the real revealer of who God is. It's like pull back the curtains and let you know who God is. And so we're going to see this through this book. I'm sure that by now, as uh, we have covered 27 books of the Bible, you have come to learn and certainly to realize that the calling of the Lord, if you may, uh, what we would call today uh, is uh, uh, occupational hazard. Sometimes people love you, sometimes people hate you. And, and so you, you go with it. And so the prophets went through these things. So before I get into it a little bit more, let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we are poised to hear from you. We are poised to hear an introduction to this book called Hosea, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us find application for our lives. That's a tough part, Lord, when we're doing an introduction. Sometimes it's full of facts, and uh, we really need your meat, Lord. So would you... Take the study beyond whatever I could do, Lord, and, and help us find relevance for us today, Lord. Help us to get to know you better, Lord, so that we might serve you better, Lord. We want to be kids, Lord, that you're, you're glad to have, Lord. Not that we're the ones that cause the headaches, Lord. So speak to our hearts even this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I, uh, Hosea is going to find out something that has been true for Every prophet that has come before him, and that will be true for the minor prophets that come also after him, and that's going to be true for your life as you try to serve the Lord. If you are a follower of Jesus, it doesn't always go well for us on the earth. And so we, we realize that many have gone before us. Many are perhaps going to come after us. Um, but through it all, each one of us, uh, as we know the Lord, we realize it's a personal walk. It's not my wife's walk. It's not my kids' walk, my grandkids' walk, my parents' walk. It is 
our walk, your walk, your individual walk with the Lord. When you close your eyes and take your last breath, uh, it's you and the Lord. No one else stands with you. No one else is going to be with you. I mean, we're going to all be together when we're all after the resurrection and we're before the Bema seat and, and we're hearing this and we're hearing that and applause are going and this applause are going on for the work we've done. But when we die, it's you and the Lord. And so you and I need to be ready and we need to know the Lord. You know, I always talk about death and are you ready for death? And uh, again, uh, a friend of mine, Brian Klein, that used to be here with us at church all the time, um, passed away uh, a, th- a couple Thursdays ago. And uh, it was interesting because what's interesting is that I golf with him, and I've been golfing with him for over almost a couple of years now, every Monday when we can get away. And so we golfed on Monday, and Thursday I'm at the airport ready to take off, and I get a phone call, Brian passed away. And I couldn't believe it. I, it just hit me. Brian does three years younger than I am, and, and uh, I'm, I'm saying, wow, Lord, we just played golf. How can this be so quick? But the point that I'm sharing this with you is that you are ready with the Lord, and you're not living off of an experience you had in 1966 or 2006 or 2016, that you have an up-to-date current relationship with the Lord. Death comes, and we're not ready for it. Just talking to Jerry uh, just a few minutes ago, and a nephew of his, you know, a couple weeks ago, young couple, car accident coming around Cedar Edge, both gone. Uh, and so, listen, do not take your life lightly. Every day is a day to be thankful to the Lord and to be ready for the Lord and to serve the Lord in any capacity that he gives us. But serving the Lord can be hazardous, as we will see uh, with our subject in Hosea. For the followers of Jesus, again, as the Apostle Paul stated, and I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, Acts 14, verse 22, quote, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. He just didn't say that to fill up a page. He said that so you can think about it. If you're going through challenges, if you're going through struggles, uh, God's going to see you through. Your job is to remain faithful to the Lord. And sometimes the hand that you're dealt, ah, you know, I feel like a loser. But the Lord is going to get you through even with your loser hand, right? So Paul says this, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of heaven. It shapes us, it forms us for yet a future that God has for us. Perhaps in the millennium, on the millennium, when he comes, these experiences are going to help us as we lead and rule with him. So it's true. So don't panic. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So we can expect opposition from this world. This world, uh, it's not so much that it's out of control. It's actually in control. The Lord knows what's going on. (coughs) You and I might not know what's going on. We might think it's falling apart, but no, it's falling into place. It really is. The Lord knows what's going on, and you and I are to be servants and be watchful and be ready. All right, so as has been true for previous prophets, the Lord is going to ask Hosea to perform um, a difficult and even humiliating task so that they may be object lessons to go along with what God's message is to his people. So if Hosea is going to be asked to do something that's humiliating, then you and I might be asked to do something that's humiliating as well. So for a man, I know for a guy, you know, if uh, someone slaps you, you already have your fist tightened and you're ready to fight back. But what did the Lord say to us? Turn the cheek. Turn the other cheek. A few years ago, we were in Israel, and uh, they had told us, our guide had told us, hey, guys, don't go to this side of the section. It's just, you know, a rough area and whatnot. Uh, stay where the tourists are, where the Americans are, where we love you. But that kind of side is a little shady. Well, Pastor Mike... I know you're listening, Mike. He thought there was an easier way. So we went another way. We listened to Pastor Mike. We walked around. And what we thought was just around the block was not. It kept going and blah, blah, blah. And we get into a situation where they're trying to sell us stuff. And they're in Judy's face. And Judy's saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. Whatnot. This Arab guy, yeah, I guess it was, spit on Judy. So, you know, what does that do to me? How have we been raised? You know, it's kind of like an old Kenny Rogers song, you know, son, you know, 
be at peace whenever you can, but sometimes you got to fight, right, or whatever. So I'm getting ready to rear up, and as I'm looking behind the other people that were there, the Arab guys are coming out. So if I get into it with this guy, none of us are going to make it back. So I looked at Judy and said, take one for the team, honey. <laughs> Let's get out of here, you know, and walked away. But I say this to you because God is going to ask Hosea to do something very, very uh, humiliating in front of people, something that you won't do in front of people, something that you would kind of be like this. Really? Are you really going to do this? And, and if God asks you to do something because it's going to have an object lesson for the rest of the people and you're serving the Lord, you must be obedient. And so that's why he says to us sometimes, turn the cheek. So uh, as we see this, at the beginning of Hosea's prophetic ministry, the Lord told him, here it is, to get married and announce that he had chosen a bride who would be unfaithful to her marriage vows, right? Her adultery then, because she's going to commit it, her adultery would give a clear picture of Israel's unfaithfulness, unfaithfulness to her covenant God. God made an agreement with Israel. If you do, I will, you know. And so Israel of old is God's wife. We, the church, are Jesus' bride. So understanding those kind of terms, if you break those kind of relationships, uh, our relationship with the Lord, he notices. He's jealous. He cares for you, and he doesn't want bad for you. So he's, he's, Israel at this time has slipped. And when I talk about Israel during Hosea's time, we're talking about the northern ten tribes, basically. Judah is not perfect down in the bottom, the last two tribes, right? But uh, it's important that you know that the focus is going to be on Israel. And remember, Israel is the one that said, uh, you know what? We have no part with you, uh, Solomon's, um, um, uh, after Solomon, uh, and they decided to go their way. So they became mavericks and went to the north, ten tribes. And so they're called Israel at this time in history, and Judah and Benjamin uh, remain. And they're the Davidic, uh, they're under the, God's hand, really, and the rest are kind of like just being rebellious and whatnot. And Israel never had a good king. In all of that we read of those ten tribes, they never once had a good king. But what hurts? What hurts is a civil war. What hurts is God's people against God's people. Ten to the north, two to the south, but they're still God's people. And it's not like he doesn't give them prophets and, and talk to them. He wants them to be together, but they're not. They kind of like you and I have our own thoughts and do our own things. And it's, it's sad. It's a sad situation. So, <coughs> excuse me. Hosea chose then. God says to him, I want you to get married. So uh, to this lady. So Hosea chose Gomer. That's her name, Gomer. And she was the daughter of Dibla, Diblaim, right? And, and as his wife, uh, they had three children, each of whom, they had three kids, and each of these kids, uh, the, uh, God gives them the name. And the name is a symbolic name. It's going to mean something because God's, again, speaking to his people. And, and you remember when we were uh, talking about, when we were in Jeremiah, God would give him some action sermons. So he'd take a pot and break it. And then he said, this is what you guys have done. You're breaking and broken our relationship. So Jeremiah had action sermons. And right here is an action again. And God's intent is for the people to see what you're doing. You know, and they're so drunk in their ways that they don't want to see the way to truth. Kind of like America is right now. Right. Uh, and, and so God's speaking to them through this real example, through his prophet. So uh, Hosea and Gomer uh, have three kids. Uh, again, of whom each received a symbolic name from the Lord. So I want to share with you number one. Number one is Jezreel, if you look up here, right? Jezreel was the firstborn son, uh, and he was a reminder of the atrocities that occurred at Jezreel. Jezreel is a city, a place that uh, God's people did some pretty bad things, horrible things. They got into idolatry. They started following the pagan ways. They started just come completely putting God out of the picture. And so God is going to remember that and he's going to judge them for that. So he gives them their firstborn son and his name is 
Jezreel. So God will soon judge Israel for these sins and appropriately through a military defeat at the same city. When they are defeated, Israel of the north, it's going to be by a military campaign of the Assyrians and it's going to be at the same place where they really started going nuts against God's ways, right? Uh, secondly, uh, the name is Lo Ruama, right? Her name means not loved. This is what this main means, not loved. So this announced, church, this announced that the Lord would temporarily, remember that word, temporarily withdraw his love from Israel. Again, we're talking about the northern kingdom. What would cause God to make you feel like he doesn't love you? You know, hmm, who did something wrong? You or God? Moi, right? So Israel, the northern kingdom, has been doing bad stuff. And so if God withdraws his hand from them, people are going to say, you're not loved. If you were loved, you would have God's blessing, right? So it's, uh, it's not a, a good thing for them. If we take that, uh, I'll get, that, get into that in just a second. I'm going to bring that to us. Uh, number three, right? So Hosea's other child means, her, the name is Lo Amin, right? Meaning not my people. Not my people. Well, we're the ones that are, today we call ourselves Christians, but if God's not for us, he's not doing anything for us, it's almost like we're not his people. Why is America, or why would we say America is not God's nation? You know why. You know what the majority of our nation, where their head's at and what's going on, right? So it would seem like if the blessings stop for America, it's almost like, well, what happened to her God? You know, it used to be in God we trust. And you have heard the arguments recently, in uh, recent years, last 10, 15 years. Uh, let's take that out of the coin, in God we trust. Let's remove that. That's where America's head is. And so when we do that, then God says, oh, you want nothing to do with me? I will withdraw my name over you temporarily. And it's always temporarily until people realize that was a dumb move. We better get back to the Lord. And they come back. And when he allows droughts, when he allows this and that to happen, it's God calling his people back to himself to be asking him for the rain, to be grateful for the rain that has fallen. So when God allows these judgments to come, it's for the purpose, yes, he's punishing us, but it's also for the purpose of drawing us back, of waking us up and coming back to him. So again, uh, this name... Uh, Loami uh, anticipated the, the, this severe disruption of the Lord's covenantal relationship with his people. And, and God does this. He will disrupt a continued, something that's been continued, something that continues our relationship with the Lord. It seems like sometimes there's a disruption. Why? It's because the people have turned their backs on the Lord. All right. So because of Gomer's adulteries, the marriage disintegrated. And she eventually, check it out, historically, she eventually became the slave or the concubine of another man. This is what happened with Gomer, right? However, what does the Lord do? Hosea, I called you. I called you so you would be a clear picture to the people. So the Lord instructs Hosea to buy back his wife. What? She's an adulteress. She did this. She did that. Da, 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 da. Yeah. She's with another man. Yeah. Yeah. Go buy her. Offer the guy the money and get her back. Hosea's act of mercy toward his wife, again, was another clear picture of the Lord's great love for Israel. God will not turn his back forever. He'll have these disruptions. He'll let these things happen so that they will see, so that they will want to come back to him. So here's the question. How does this relate to us today? What can we draw, and, and how do we find an application for our lives today? Well, number one, Jezreel, right? Let's talk about that. Have you committed wrongs against the Lord that you have not repented of? You know, have we done that, and we've never gone back to the Lord? Are you here in Montrose, Colorado, because it went really bad for you in the last city that you were in? We want to say, welcome, but we want to say, get right with the Lord. Get right with the Lord. Get you right with the Lord so your family can be walking right with the Lord. 
If you are not right with the Lord, it's going to affect everything. And just because you move from city to city, we don't leave it there. God's going to bring it to your attention. We must take care of the bads that we did in other cities or whatever. And the way we do that is we come to the Lord. Lord, forgive me for my dumb things I did while I was in Germany, while I was in East Los Angeles, while I was in, you know, Orange County, while I was whatever. Go to the Lord and take care of that because it will always be a Jezreel for you. Right? And so we need to, to think about that. Secondly, lo ruama, right? Not love. Do you feel today, you who are listening on radio or, or, or tuning in, do you feel unloved by the Lord? Right? He, he does love you, but just, but just maybe you are hanging on to things that puts a wall between you and the Lord. So when he removes his hand from you, do you feel unloved? All of a sudden everything's going wrong for you? Maybe you need to think about this, and since you tell the Lord you love him, you want to be loved, then he says, show me by being obedient. You know, I want obedience more than sacrifice. Don't be giving me all your tithe money. Don't be giving me special presents. Don't be volunteering at church if you're not being obedient when you're living at home, when you're out in mantras doing your thing. You must be obedient to the Lord. He desires our obedience more than sacrifice. It's, it's a big thing to the Lord that you're faithful to him since he's the one that saved you. He's the one that is brought you out of darkness. He wants to spend eternity with you. He loves you. He really, really loves you. So it's up to us. If we're not feeling love, there is something wrong. If you feel like the Lord, he loves everybody else, but he doesn't love me, well, maybe it's me. And not maybe, it is me. You know, so we need to be thinking about that as well. He, he does love you, but you're hanging on to stuff that is creating that wall, as I said, between you and him. So repent. Let whatever is holding you or keeping you from the Lord to have a pure and 100% relationship, let that go. Why? Because he's jealous for you, man. He is really jealous for you. He loves you. Third, third one, lo amim, not my people. Church, we're either completely his or we're not. Where are you? You're either 100% his or you are not. There is no middle ground. If you live like a saint on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday you're acting out like the devil's kids, uh, that's a problem. That is a big problem. And I can't tell you how much that is true. It used to be true in my house when I was growing up. On church we were saints. Monday through Saturday, Saturday we were ain'ts. You know, <laughs> we weren't saints. So if this is you, repent. He wants you as his child 24-7 right? 365, right? He wants you as his child all the time, not part-time. All right, let's talk about the author, the date that uh, this was uh, written. So Hosea is the author. He is the son of Beri, right? And he prophesies during the 8th century B.C. So that's 800 years before Jesus uh, is born. His ministry began while Uzziah also known as Azariah, was king of Judah, and Jeroboam II was king of Israel. So you have two kings, the, the bottom of the, the two of, from Judah and the ten from uh, Israel. Hosea, Hosea's prophetic career spanned the reigns of the Judean kings uh, Jotham and Ahaz, and it ended during Hezekiah's rule. Hosea also witnessed the reigns of at least six kings of the north, although he did not name those kings. North, I mean Israel, right? But he doesn't name any of them in his prophecies. Why? I don't know. But I venture to guess because they weren't acting like his people. They were doing bad things. Remember, Jeroboam, um, when he became the king of Israel, the north, because he wouldn't follow David's sons and, and the kingdom that God had established, he said something that really caused a big problem, actually caused this to happen. He said, guys, we don't have to go down to Jerusalem to the temple to worship. In fact, I'm going to create a temple up here so that you don't have to go down there. Some of the guys are saying, the faithful are saying, but God's word says that we must worship at the temple. And he's saying, yeah, 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 but, you know, we don't have to go down there. And really he's thinking that the people might go and betray him or whatever. He's, he has personal reasons for this. 
And Israel, the north, slipped and slipped and backslid and backslid. They made their gods. They made their capitals. They started trying to duplicate what was going on in Jerusalem, the real deal, with the fake deal because they were all in rebellion. All ten tribes were in rebellion to God's plan. And now we're not saying that, the, that uh, Judah, Benjamin and Judah, uh, and Judah were perfect. Never said that. But let God work out the government. Don't go against God's plan. If he has made something clear, uh, that's the way it is. Such as, you should not steal. But everybody else is stealing. You should not steal. Don't lie on your taxes. Get someone to do your taxes so they keep you, you know, you want to say, but, but. You want to say, this is a gray area. You know, we always want to do that. Don't, don't even go there. You know, as a Christian, let your people do the taxes or whoever does the taxes. And if you're doing it, be black and white. <coughs> be clear. Don't go into the gray areas. And if you say, but others do it. I just heard so-and-so got a big thing because he said this and that. It sounds shady. It is shady before the Lord. So even if everyone starts doing something, don't you do it. So that's what happened to the north. They started having their own temple. They built their own, made their own things to God. And they just got into idolatry really bad. So it wasn't good, right? All right, the settings. Hosea began prophesying during the time of general prosperity. In other words, things seemed pretty good. Uh, when, when, uh, when Hosea came on the scene, the northern countries, uh, the north Israel was doing good. Financially, powerfully gaining land, they were doing pretty good, right? Uh, Jeroboam, the king of the north, had extended Israel's borders through several military operations. So he was successful uh, in his military campaigns. He was doing great. In the south, Uzziah had strengthened Judah's army, armed forces, and they defeated their nation's enemies. So it all seems like it's going really good, right? And there's some outward success of these two nations. They look good, but signs of trouble were on the horizon. What happens when someone, um, and every guy, again, that has punched the other guy in the nose and the other guy couldn't fight back, you feel pretty good about yourself. You even re win the respect of some other guys, and not everybody picks on you. And what happens to uh, people uh, is the same thing that happens to nations. These guys started feeling pretty strong about themselves. And once again, when you feel good about your army and you feel good about what you've accomplished, you stop depending on the Lord. You even stop asking, should I go to battle? Should I not go to battle? Should I take this job? Should I not take this job? You know, and, and it's a problem with us. Again, God wants us dependent on him, not independent. God wants you holding his hand, not letting go of his hand. Hey, I'll catch you later. When things get tough, I'll never forget you. I love you. You're my Jesus. Doesn't want that from us. He wants an everyday relationship with the Lord. You know, I need a car. All right, the Lord says, go get a car. You know, you don't have to be asking what color, what make, or what. That's not the, the Lord's going to let you decide. Go get your car. You know, he's already giving you the okay for that. But at the same time, when, you know, he just likes to be involved. You know, uh, it is good to have a relationship, if you're married, that you're talking all the time. You're asking about this and you're asking about that. It's just good communication. And it's more important with your Lord who loves you, who loves you, who cares for you. It's important that you talk to him about business decisions. It's important that you talk to him about moves. It's important that you talk to him about anything that's, that's going on in your life that's going to have, even if it's little, it's a good thing to talk about the Lord. Lord, I don't want to bother you all the time. I know people have cancer, people have this, people have that, but I kind of got this sticker on me, and I'm afraid to take out the sticker. It's okay to pray about your sticker with the Lord. He's not going to say, don't bother me. Go ask Peter or something. He's not going to do that to you, right? He's going to say, well, you know, we'll take care of that, you know, and the Lord loves you, and he, he's, he cares about details. That's your God. He cares about details. So, Though they looked like they were, uh, they were good, things are going well, trouble is on the horizon. As the book of Isaiah makes clear, idolatry, especially uh, the worship of the Canaanite god Baal, or Baal, however you pronounce it, it was widespread in the northern kingdom. Why? Because they weren't going to Jerusalem. Because someone said we could have church out here. Be careful with these people that come up to you and tell you, you know, we're not going to church anymore it's too traditional we're going to find god in the woods we're going to find god fishing 
We're going to find God. I worship God when I'm in the mountains. No, you don't. You're worshiping the creation. You're not worshiping the creator. We, as God's kids, did not invent the church. The Lord did. And he says, do not forsake coming to church. Do not forsake gathering where you can build one another up. He likes his team. He loves his kids. How many of you guys like to eat Thanksgiving by yourselves? Raise your hands. Anybody here? How about you on the radio? Are you on? You know, raise your hand. I can see you, right? Do you want to have Thanksgiving by yourself? No. Nobody wants to have Thanksgiving by themselves. Even your lost, goofy uncle, you know, or auntie, you don't mind having them over for Thanksgiving. God wants his kids at his table. God wants his kids together. As many times as you could come to church, come to church. There will come a time when you won't be able to come to church. There's going to come a time when the strength of your youth will fail you as you get older. Where illness or a sickness will come, you won't be able to make it to church. When I had my knee first done and I couldn't be at church, man, I had the, the, the YouTube thing or whatever it is that we catch it on. It worked. It worked great, and I was glad. But guess what? It's not the same as seeing your faces. It's not the same as saying hello to you. It's not the same as having a hug from you or me hugging you or whatever. It's not the same. God wants his kids to gather as often as we can. And, and it's a good thing to do. Those that, that can't, we understand. Please don't take this as Ben's throwing an a, a arrow at me. If you can't make it to church, I get it. And that's what I'm saying. When you can, get here. But when you can't, there's nothing you can do. We get older and we don't have that strength anymore. We won't have transportation. We get called from Delta or Cedar Red sometimes. Can you bring us to church? I'd like to, but I can't drive up there Sunday morning and then come back up here and have church. We just can't sometimes. So people don't make it to church. Uh, a lot of people who are in those senior homes can't make it to church, right? They just can't. So when you can, you should come. Do everything you can until you can't anymore. All right. So idolatry was big, but that Canaanite God, Baal, and especially in the northern kingdoms, as I said. Then the assassination of Zechariah, Jeroboam's son and his successor in 753, <coughs> excuse me, B.C., ended Yehu or Jehu's dynasty and introduced a new era of political turmoil. Before, you would read this and you'd think about, well, what does politics have to do with anything? Has politics not separated our country? Has politics not put us like this with each other in many uh, situations? Uh, politics has a great effect on the people, on a nation. And when, when the nation is split, politics is usually the thing, the devil's tool, to get everybody fighting with each other. And so for the north, it became, uh, uh, you know, who's going to reign and who's going to kill who and who's going to assassinate one. It started going really bad up there. And making matters worse, the mighty Assyrian Empire, after several decades, decades, of, decades of declining power, was once again, Assyria was starting to flex their muscles, if you may, right? And they were not only, when a, again, when a country builds up, it's not so much they focus on themselves. They start looking to the left, to the west. They start looking to the right, to the east. They start looking to the north, to the south. Where can we get more resources from? Right? One of the main reasons Japan attacked the United States way back in the day was because the resources for their people, there was just a, a small country. They needed more. And to get more resources, you have to go outside your borders. Why is Russia looking at Ukraine and why is this and that going on? Because countries start looking elsewhere to gain their power. So back in the day, Assyria started flexing again. They were nothing at this time. Decades have passed by, but now they had grown again. They're getting tough, right? And they start uh, uh, getting on the move, if you may. Uh, so they started flexing muscles. They're looking uh, westward, and westward for them is the Mediterranean. And who's in the way? Israel. During the second half of the 8th century uh, B.C. again, Assyria, they got so tough that the northern kingdom, Israel, um, uh, was reduced to a vassal, V-A-S-S-A-L, a vassal state. And you say, all right, I was in school that day when they talked about the word vassal. What does that mean? What that means is um, they required by treaty to pay 
regular tribute to Assyria, such as if China had the United States surrounded and said, by the way, we own 75% of Los Angeles, we own 75% of New York City, we, know, we own all this stuff, uh, and we're going to actually come against you, and we already have your, strategically, we're just going to beat you. You don't have enough bullets to kill all our people that's coming to war. Uh, so, you have a choice. Let your people live. Continue with your United States government, but you will pay me, China says, $200 million a year, which is cheap. But if you pay me $200 million a year, I will not destroy or call the debt in on America. So America would think, man, it's true. If the, all their strategists, all their guys got together, they're right. Checkmate for us. We can't fight back. We're going to lose everything. Then we, if we agreed to pay China, we would become a vassal state. That's what a vassal state is. So Assyria comes around Israel, the ten tribes of the north, and says, dude, you don't have a chance against us. We're mightier. We'll kill. We'll slaughter your grandma. We'll slaughter your grandpa. We'll slaughter the kids, the pregnant moms. We are going to mess you up. And remember, Assyria, their armies were horrific. One of the worst armies in the world, that would, how they would treat prisoners. And if they were taking you back, they would put fish hooks on your back, strip you down naked with big hooks. They would drag you. Come on, we're going to, this way. And the people are dying all the way over there. It was horrific the way it was. So Israel decided, mm, we're not going to fight back. The ten tribes in the north. They became a vassal state and paid what they asked them. Then, after a couple, two, three years, they became a puppet state. What does that mean? That means you're ruled by someone that Assyria assigned to rule you. So it would be like the United States. If we became a puppet state, it would be like China, using that example, would have a Chinese guy being the president of the United States running it for China. That's what a puppet state would be, right? And finally, they, they became, Israel became a province, which means you're just ruled by an Assyrian governor. So that would mean the United States would be the governors now. Uh, in the 50 states, we'll all be Chinese, and they would rule uh, our country. So that's what, what the, a vassal state, that's what a puppet state, and that is what a province would look like. And this happened to Israel. God allowed it. Why? They weren't worshiping in Jerusalem. They set up their own camp. You know, so God temporarily, he removes his blessing from the nation of Israel. So church, Judah also declined spiritually. They went downhill and was torn by political dissension. Political dissension again. Again, kind of like America, we're split in half right now because of politics. King Ahaz rejected Isaiah's offer, the prophet of divine protection. And what did he do? Well, he embarked on a pro-Assyrian takeover of the Palestinian states. So he reduced Judah to a vassal's status and he drained the nation's economic wealth. And that's what they're going to do. They will drain you of your money. Inflation does that. And if we have presidents that are not looking out for the people, then the price of eggs goes up, right? Price of bread goes up. We happen to be, again, in um, St. Thomas, and we're down to the last few days, and we have bought enough groceries at the beginning to keep us going the whole week so we're not eating in restaurants all the time going broke, right? So Judy has to go out to the market, and uh, it was right there at the resort. So she goes, and I'm going to go get some bread, a loaf of bread. It's just a few steps away, a couple floors down from where we're at. And she comes back. How'd it go? And her eyes are like saucers. I said, what happened, babe? What happened down there? And she's looking at me, 12 bucks for a loaf of bread. I said, what kind of bread is it? I'm thinking it's something special. Nope, not even wheat. Not even this, not even a Wonder Bread or a City Market or a Kroger seal on it. It was just bread. You know, 12 slices, 12 bucks. You know, well, man, we better make half sandwiches for our meals from that point on. You know, it's great to go on vacation, but you better hang on to your wallet. You know, and you better know how to plan and, and get used to ramen or something because, yeah, it's, it's not sometimes all what it seems like it's going to be. Anyway, so... Kine has rejected Isaiah's offer, and uh, it became a vassal state. It drained the nation uh, economic of its economic wealth. All right, let's talk about structure. When we look at the book of 
uh, Hosea, how is it structured? How do we look at this book and we, we could look at chapter 1? Sometimes I just like to read through and I, I take it verse by verse and stuff. But when you're introducing the book, you get to kind of like get away from the book and take like a helicopter view and look down. How is this book, all 14 chapters, how is it structured? Well, we will note the book of Hosea fluctuates between judgment and salvation. Each of the book's five major sections begins on a sour note. Sorry, but it begins pretty sad. It's pretty bleak when you begin to read. And God tells him to pick up a wife that's a prostitute or something like that. And we'll read that when we get to it, right? Uh, <coughs> so each one begins uh, on a sour note. But here's the thing with how it's structured. It concludes with a very positive affirmation of God's commitment. How he still loves his people. So no matter how it starts, it starts pretty bad. But the way it's structured in every section, those five sections that we're going to read about, it it ends with a, a, a positive affirmation, God's commitment to his people, and the expectation. The people always are expecting that God is going to restore us. It's like he's going to bail us out. He's going to turn it around. We are going to prosper once again. That's how the book of Isaiah is structured. Begin sour. Every time we get to the section, oh, oh, you're reading it. But it ends very positively. The people have hope. So for some of us, let me put it this way. We start off our day without prayer. Sometimes we start off our day without spending any time in a devotion, not even a one pager, not even a half a page. Oh, it's too much. Or you forget about it. We just don't do it. I mean, he did give you the rest, right? You did sleep all night. Some of us half the night. Some of us are getting four hours, but we're getting four hours, right? Uh, He did give us rest. He has placed a roof over your head. Is anybody still right here living outside? You know, no. He put a roof over your head no matter where you're living, right? And he provided breakfast. Some of you don't eat breakfast, right? Judy and I hardly ever eat breakfast. We love to when we get a chance to, and we'll run to Starbucks or Arvins or someplace, Denny's or whatever. But sometimes we don't get a chance because we're on the phone, we're running, someone has an appointment somewhere. But we are grateful for a cup of coffee. Anybody? Do we have any coffee drinkers here? Raise your hand if you're, right? I just found out this last week in St. Thomas, that my wife can only go 2.5 days without caffeine. <laughs> and and uh, if you don't, if she's not with her java, you know, if she's not drinking something with a little caffeine, my wife, she's very kind, patient, you know, very nice, but I could see something's going on, <laughs> you know. And, you know, it's just get her some caffeine. We know that's the answer. But what I'm trying to say is we have started off our day and God has provided for us. Then it's off to work or whatever uh, is going on until, until, until something goes wrong. And when we try to fix it and our fix doesn't work, it gets a little bit more serious. And when it gets a little bit more serious, that's kind of when we start looking up, Lord, uh, (coughs) Sorry, I didn't pray this morning, and thank you for the coffee or whatever. Uh, But that's when we start looking for him, which is great. But in the picture that I just gave you, Israel and Judah were not grateful to the Lord. And so things started happening in their lives that it didn't go so good for them. Until, again, so it starts off sour, but towards the end, when they start looking to God, right, it gets better. So there's a lesson here for you and I. If you're starting off your day and you're not used to praying, would you start praying in the morning? Just a little advice for you. Will you start being grateful to the Lord for what you do have? Because it's very, e- very easily we can lose it all. If China did call in their notes and whatnot, uh, we'd be at war because we couldn't, we couldn't stop everything that we're doing and pay them back. Uh, someone said that for every $10 you have in your pocket, about four of them belong to China. So you really got six bucks in the way the business is structured around the United States right now. It, it's just the way it is, economics. All right. So uh, it's, when you realize that uh, things are not going good, go to the Lord. He fixes our situation. Why? Because he really, once again, he really loves you as an individual. That's who God is. 
well, are you, you know, my name is Bob Smith. There could be a lot of Bob Smiths, and there is a lot of Bob Smith in the world. But if your name is Bob Smith and you gave your life to Jesus, he knows you. He knows you. He's not going to mistake you for the other Bob Smith. Our God loves you as an individual. He cares for you. And that's why when you say your thank yous, he's receiving it. He's glad. He smiles because you're showing gratitude for what he's done for you. So, yeah, that's the way the, the structure of this book. It starts off sour, but it ends with good. So don't miss that lesson. All right. Last part that we're going to talk about as an introduction is the purpose and the major theme. So Hosea's purpose was to denounce sin. The reason he's writing this book to the people of God is so that they would denounce sin. Denounce this, come on, guys, put sin away. Put it away. Stop doing it. You're, 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 you're going to frustrate your own life. God's going to, you know, not love. You're going to feel like you're not loved. You're going to feel like he's pulled away. You know, you're going to feel all this stuff because you're not putting away your sin. So that's what it is. His purpose was also to warn of impending judgment. If we don't stop, if you guys don't stop, God is going to judge us. But also to assure the faithful, and there's always a remnant. There's always those people in a, in a state, in a city, in a town. There's always God's faithful people, and he wanted to assure them that God's love would win out in the end as it will be for us. Again, through much tribulation, we must enter into heaven but the point is, we do enter in, is it not? We're going to enter in. So how, what, how do we apply that to us? Well, this message is for us today. If you're looking at what happened yesterday, then we need to be thinking for us. The rapture is imminent. It's going to happen. It's going to happen just as the prophets warned the people that they would be judged, and they did. Assyria came, took away the northern kingdom. Later on, you know, Babylon comes in and takes away Judah. For us, the rapture is going to happen. That really is going to take place, right? So put sin away and start looking up. Your redemption is near. The Bible tells us that, tells us, start looking up. It's, it's really going to happen. So Israel, quote, the northern kingdom, is the primary focus of Hosea's prophecy. They're the ones that are going to get the, the main share of this. Hosea accused the nation of being unfaithful, again, to its vows. Israel is supposed to be God's wife. And if you're unfaithful to God, you're breaking your marriage vows. Just as his own, uh, Hosea saying, just as his own adulterous wife had been unfaithful to her vows and did the things that she did. By, and you say, well, how? How does a nation do that to God? How would I do that to God? Well, for them, they participated in pagan fertility rites, if you may. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, fertility rites of Baalism, if there's such a word, right? The people violated their covenant to the Lord. They started doing things the way the Assyrians did things and not the way God has things happen. They started uh, worshiping the Baals. You know, they started worshiping uh, other things. Church, the Lord... He did not tolerate this rebellion at all. And he was prepared to bring against Israel the judgments that he threatened to do back in Deuteronomy. If you do this, I will do that. If you don't do this, then I'm going to do this. God was there with them. And what was his purpose? Well, God's purpose, and, and however, was not entirely to punish them. His purpose was not entirely to punish them. He intended that these severe judgments that he's going to put them through would bring the nations to its senses. Again, Hosea proclaimed that the Lord would eventually restore his marriage with his people and again pour his blessings upon them. And that's a great deal when no matter what's going on in your life, God could turn it around. Sunday, I wasn't here. Um, Sarah received a call from a guy that had been in the, the Brown Center years ago. He was a young teenager at the time. He's uh, mid or late 30s now, and Sarah used to work at the Brown Center. And uh, Sarah would bring the kids upstairs to um, uh, shoot pool, play ping pong, and talk about the Lord. 
And most of these kids that were at the Brown Center, their parents had um, abandoned them or they didn't have parents, so they just got in trouble. And it was kind of like a juvenile hall, but it was here in town in Montrose called the Brown Center. Uh, so she gets this call from this fellow. And uh, they go and they, um, uh, John and Sarah went over to uh, Delta, where he was at, close to the high school, and, and uh, talked to him. They brought him bread, the kind of beans. He was living in his trailer, very grateful that the landlord had allowed him to park a little trailer there and whatnot. And uh, the guy tells him, hey, I'm facing some big-time charges. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I just felt in my heart that I should call you, Sarah, because you used to talk about God and whatnot, and I think I need him. I think I need help and whatnot. And so... Uh, Sarah shared with us, with Judy and I, um, on Tuesday when we were home and, and whatnot, uh, Dad, this guy, um, so-and-so, uh, just needs some help in the worst way. And we went to go see him on Sunday. I brought him a little bit of food. We didn't shower him with a bunch of food, just that $12 loaf of bread, if you may. No, just kidding. But the little bread, a can of beans or whatever, right? And uh, he seemed sincere, Dad. Just saying, he seemed sincere. So I talked to John, and he says, yeah, he, he did seem sincere, so... He also said that uh, a long time ago, you know, he was, uh, had his little trailer parked here in, the, uh, in front of, uh, I think it was Hastings at that time, and you showed up and, and uh, said, how can I help you and he to get your trailer out of here? And uh, he says, I just need some gas money. And he said that, sir, your dad came out of nowhere, and he gave me like 20, 10, 15 bucks for gas, and I was able to move my, my trailer out of here and whatnot. So I know that you guys are Christian people and whatnot, and I just need help. So he was struggling with addictions. This guy is uh, struggling with addictions, big-time charges he's facing um, end of the month, and we're going to see what's going to happen with that. But he didn't know what to do at this time. So we have a connection with Calvary Ranch down the street here, and uh, we support them every month and whatnot. And though it costs for someone uh, usually with PTSD or a drug addict that's trying to, that in his heart wants to do right now and just get away from all this stuff, get away from the people. We have a place called Calvary Ranch. We're not as affiliated with them. It's just a ministry here in town. And uh, anyway, so I called uh, the director, and I said, hey, uh, I have this guy here. Seems like the real deal. Uh, would you accept him? And he says, yes. Just get him and bring him over. He says, he has no money. I said, I said get him and bring him over. We'll do what we can. And so if you ever go to the kitchen, you see the missions that we, suppo uh, the missions that we support, you'll see Calvary Ranch there. And so I talked to the director, Tim, and, and uh, I went down to Delta, and as I was heading down, I get a text. And usually that, this is what happens. I can't go today. I have a dog. I have to attend the funeral. And there is, could be 101 reasons why today is not the day. That's the devil fighting, right? They felt in their heart. They made the call. They want to help. But the devil gets in there some way, and all of a sudden, other things seem important. So I said, look, I'm pulling over on the side of the road. It's either a go or no go. You know, you, you got to let me know. And he says, well, is there any way, we're texting, is there any way you, you can pick me up on Monday? I said, no. I got things to do next week. You know, I can't, can't do that on Monday. It's a go or no go. I'm going to wait here five minutes and give me a call. And so sure enough, he calls back. He says, it's a go. I'll make it work. So I went to go get him. Brought him all the way back to uh, Calvary Ranch. Introduced him to the rector. We prayed. Uh, this guy right now is being taken care of, right? Uh, it's because it's a Christian place. I'm looking forward to the phone call. Hey, we're going to baptize this guy in this cold water, the river, as you know, but this is how it is, and we baptize people in cold water. This great wake-up call. Wow. So I'm just saying that... Uh, uh, when God deals with us, right, he deals with us and he lets, as he let this guy, as he let Israel, as he uh, allowed Judah, sometimes to get to their worst, God allows it so that the people could look up again to him and ask for mercy and be restored. As this guy is, so did the nations. As I help this guy, God's willing to help. If you get into a situation where you need help, Come to the Lord. He has an open invitation for you. He's there for you. During the tribulation period, in the future, when that comes, God will pour his wrath on the people of the world for rejecting his son, for sure. Yet at the same time, he desires to bring people to their senses. All to the book of Revelation says his arm is stretched out, you know, willing to help. 
And if you're that person or there's people that say you need help, if they reach up to God, God will take them by the hand and pull them out of the darkness and help them. They still have to face their consequences. It's like we tell every inmate when we're in the jails, you're going to face consequences for your sins, but at least you're free on the inside of bars. You know, you're still free with the Lord. And so that's a good place to be. So Israel's covenant relationship with God is the heart of Isaiah's, of Hosea's message. God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. Did he not? Sure he did. He established them as a nation, and he took great delight in them. He really did. He looked for a favorable response to his love and obedience to the commandments that he had given them to regulate the people's worship and daily activities. However, the people were ungrateful. Back to us. Don't be ungrateful to the Lord. Right? The people were ungrateful, turning to other gods, violating the religious and social standards of God's covenant, and forming alliances with the surrounding nations. People that lean to other things, go to other places. Well, Pastor Ben, there's, there's other ways than just Jesus Christ. I tell them, no, there's not. Well, we're going to try. Good luck to you. You know, it's not out there. I don't even say good luck anymore. I say, wow, I feel sorry for you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. You're, you're so close. Well, you know, narrow is the way to heaven. Broad is the road to destruction. Right? It's up to you. But when the people go, they, they, they put themselves, not in harm's way, but you're, you become an open target for the devil to work in your life. So we introduce the Lord with them, uh, to them. So know this. If God has established and has established a binding relationship, he demands absolute loyalty. Absolute loyalty to him. Did you hear that? He demands absolute loyalty. You try sneaking out to this way, the Holy Spirit's going to zap you and say, hey, man, what are you doing? We've been down this road before. You can't say, well, I'm just thinking I, I, I. I is the middle letter of the word sin. I. Well, I just think, oh, oh your ego is getting in the way. Ego is an acronym for easing God out. That's what ego stands for. Easing God out. You think you're going to do it your way, right? Not a good place to be. Though Hosea, through Hosea, God announced that he would use severe judgment to free his people again from their stupor, right, their spiritual stupor, and get their attention. And this judgment, again, for them would take place like droughts, invasion by a foreign army, and then exile. You're kicked out of your own country. All right. So I believe it's a matter of time before God judges America, bringing that up to today. For he has also, if you think about it, the Lord brought the pilgrims here, right? He freed us from England's rule, especially to, everybody had to belong to the Church of England. God gave us religious freedom that we can ra praise the Lord the way we wanted to. He raised us up as a nation under God. He did that for us. But we too, as a nation now, have rejected him these last years and have turned to other God, gods with a small g. So judgment, as it was in the past, is imminent. And that's how you see and learn how God deals with people. He's been very patient with us. Though the severity of God's judgment, judgment might give the impression that Israel has been abandoned forever, God intends to restore his people. He always does, right? When they repented of their sins, he would return them to their land. He would reunite both the north and the south. God's going to reunite them under an ideal Davidic king. Who's that going to be? Jesus. Jesus is going to rule. You know, son of David, right? And he's going to restore rich blessings on all of them during the millennial reign, those that come to him. So let's talk about God's jealousy just for a second before we close. While his jealousy, it may seem inappropriate, and his discipline may seem harsh. Uh, this divine reaction to his people's sin is actually evidence of his love for them. God does things really well. His love and his commitment for them. He will allow nothing to ruin the relationship, if you may, he has established and will do everything, everything possible to preserve it. He wants you for him. So he allows things to happen so you could look to him. In the end, his devotion and his mercy is going to win out. And his people will come to their senses, giving him the love and the uh, love him and obedience and that he desires. So now, we are ready for 
the rest of the scripture. But it's not going to come until the next time we are together. We will start Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, the next time we're together. Let's go ahead and close uh, this introduction with prayer. Father, we thank you for you giving us a background for Hosea, Lord. And we're, we're growing, Lord, as we learn more about you, how you deal with people, your patience, your ways, Lord. And certainly your ways are higher than our ways, Lord. And so, Lord, as we get into this book, Lord, I pray that you would be speaking to our hearts, Lord. Uh, always, Lord, to be our, that our hearts are lined up with yours and that we are obedient and doing your will. Help us, Lord, in our weaknesses, Lord. Help us not to make our weakness a lifestyle, Lord, but help us repent from it, Lord, when we do fall. And thank you, Lord, for caring for us until the end. You tell us, Lord, that because we're in your hand, no one can take us away from it. And since you've begun a good work in us, you'll be faithful to complete it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that, Lord. We look forward to being with you forever. Be now, Lord, with my brothers and sisters who are here, those who are listening on radio, those who have tuned in online. Bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.